G'day, it's Adam from OMG Tech. Today, we're going to be taking apart a DVD drive. See what's on the inside of that. Um, we'll need some safety goggles for when we're dealing with small parts that might come flying up. And I've got some uh, blasters on hand in case I cut myself. Unlikely, but it's good to be safe. At OMG Tech, we like to take apart CD and DVD drives because they've got so many interesting bits and pieces in them. Um, there's just really a lot to learn. The first thing I'm going to do is take this paper clip and bend it a bit straight. Now, if I push the eject button, nothing happens because this thing's not plugged into anything. We don't want any power in here because, as per the label, it's a class one laser product, which means that it's not that dangerous laser wise. Um, but it also says here, class 3B laser radiation when open, avoid exposure to the beam. We don't want to be getting exposed to the laser in this. Um, so we've got it powered off. Uh, powering off a device is generally a very good first step if you're going to be taking it apart. It doesn't work with everything. If it's got a power supply, particularly power supplies and computers can often hold an electrical charge for a, a period of time after they've been unplugged. So you've got to be real careful with that. But we wouldn't want to be doing this if it was plugged into the power, that's for sure. So I'm going to pop my paper clip down inside this little hole. If I press that, there's definitely something going on in there. Uh, this is the, the manual eject. I might use my, here we go, flat screwdriver to help lift that out. Um, some of these will manually eject better than others. Give that another go. Just carefully finding the thing to push. No, there's, it's definitely, there we go. There we go. Now you wouldn't want to do that too much. It's not good for the, for the drive to be driven in that way. Um, but we like to get that open uh, because later on, this part is going to hold uh, some of the other bits together. Um, and it's just better to have that open. But I'm going to put that closed again so that we can see the benefit of having it open later on. Let's double check that. No, that's now locked in. Um, and that's going to hold the front face on. We're just going to get in our way later. But for now, let's have a look at the screws. These four screws are pretty straightforward. There's also these two here. Now these, so there's one here and one here, one here. Um, there's actually a helpful label here, M3 times 6. Um, now this would be, it's a metric screw. It's uh, size 3 this way and size 6 this way. Uh, probably 3 millimeters and 6 millimeters. Let's see, I'm going to grab my other camera. So we can have a close look at this funky looking screw. It's an unusual one. I'm sure all of you have seen screws that look like this one. This is a fairly common sort of screw. It's called a Phillips. Uh, but then if we turn over, have a look at this screw. This screw is definitely a bit different. So I might start with that different screw, just because it's a bit more interesting. Let me see. I think I'll use this one. So this is a Torx screw head. Uh, it looks like a little six point star. And that's, that's meshed quite well. So you're not, not using too much work. If you use the wrong screwdriver on a screw, it can often lead to problems. Uh, using the wrong screw, the screwdriver with the wrong type of screw can strip it and make it impossible to turn later. These are the flat tops, these are uh, Phillips head screws, and these, I believe, are called Torx screws. Oh, another interesting thing about these screws compared to the other screws, these screws have a very like solid cylinder for the head, whereas these ones have a rounded top. Just a little detail, some of them will be even more different. I've got, let me see. 
another option that I can use for the screws, the funky screws. If you check out on Wikipedia, there's like 50 different kinds of screw heads, which I find very interesting. Particularly interesting is being able to tell the difference between a Phillips and a JIS and a Posi Drive. Posi Drive and the Phillips, they're both fairly common. So this is a, let's see, this is a flat four. And that's actually also able to drive this one. It's interesting that they've got this screw head, which seems to be a combination of Torx and flat. Uh, not 100% sure why that is. Um, another fun, interesting little detail for these two, which I'm going to get a close-up of. Um, these two have some texture on the very bottom of the screw, which I guess is for for friction and for grip when they're tightened up. Um, but if you know for sure what they're for and can let me know in the comments, I'd be very interested to know. Get the last one of these out using the flat head screwdriver again. Now, I think that these ones were probably used to fix the unit into its, um, fix it to some plastic to mount it in position within the computer. Um, I'm not an expert. I do know a fair bit about different pieces on the inside. I'm just switching over to a Phillips screwdriver to get to these four on the bottom. I'll pop those over here. It's good to keep your workspace tidy when you're doing this sort of thing. Especially, now we've, we've spoken about the risk of small objects hitting your eyes and the fact that we're wearing safety glasses for that. We've got um, I guess the risk of a screwdriver um, causing a scrape. We've got band-aids. These small parts are all choking hazards, which is not a big issue for me because I'm not often tempted to eat uh, these things. But if you're doing this at home and you have a, a very small baby brother or sister, you might be needing to be very careful with where you put these things make sure that they don't get swallowed. Oh, so that top's come off without too much trouble. I'll place that down here. Um, and that's revealed a whole lot of really interesting stuff. Now I've got a little list, a, a scavenger hunt of sorts. So I would like to find something that moves in a straight line, something that spins in circles, something that thinks, something shiny, something pretty, something that connects. I'd like to find some magnets that attract. I would like to find something that flashes and shines, something that connects, uh, connects electronically as well as physically, um, something you can press and something that turns other things. And I think we're going to be able to find all those things in here. Um, let's see, that's coming off just fine. All this is going to be a little bit trickier over here. So let's see what happens if we flip this over. Well, there's definitely a lot of stuff attached under here. Hmm. What can I do to make this a little bit easier? So if I turn this over, um, I've got a connector in here. The way the connector is, it's very much underneath itself, but there's this big blue tab. So I'm going to there we go, pull the blue tab and it will come loose so we can open that up a little bit more. So this is a ribbon cable. You guys have probably encountered cables and plugs in your life. Ribbon cables are cables designed to be flat. Now I'm going to grab the other camera so we can get a real close look at that because that's a whole lot of wires. And instead of being in a bundle, they're all laid out flat next to each other. So you can see each of those lines is a little wire and they all run next to each other, neat and tidy through, neat and tidy around uh, the CD drive. Um, you can see if I push, this part moves backwards and forwards, which is why it needs to have a flexible cable to connect it to the rest of the device. And let's see if we can open these. 
think these will also need just a little bit of a gentle tug. We've got this blue section here, which I think is some reinforcement so that it doesn't break. This part here, let's see if we can we place it back where it was. Where, well, there we go. It's been about here. So this is where it was, and so we can see the connector that connects to the outside, to the rest of the computer. Um, uh, inside, we've got all these uh, all these leads coming down to solder pads, so that the connector is able to talk to this whole circuit board. We can also see where the connector has been soldered down uh, to either end. And that I think is uh, more mechanical than anything else, so it will be connected into the ground plane. Uh, so it is all electrically connected. We've got all sorts of interesting things on this circuit board. So I'm going to switch back to the uh, close-up camera and see what I can see. So we've got oops, a whole bunch of things with little labels that start with the letter C. You can see C12, C13, C3, C2, and there's one that says R. All right, so this is really getting nice and close up to these things. Sigma Z, C13, C12, C, looks like it's a C9 maybe. This one looks like, what's it got written there? It's very hard to see because they're all so small. So that's C3, C2, we've got this one, it says, that's an R5. We've got C4, that one's hard to read. Now this one, whoops, lost it. That one's an R. The ones that are labeled with an R are gonna be resistors, and the ones that are labeled with a C are capacitors. And the capacitors are devices that, oh, they're, electronic components that will uh, they'll affect changes in voltage and um, that's their biggest role the resistor just resists the flow of voltage capacitors are more about the change in the voltage you can tell that they're capacitors because they say c and resistors because they say r there's obviously going to be a lot more little labels around and sometimes they're a little bit differently labeled um, i can tell that they're uh, ceramic capacitors just by looking at them and this one here has a little label I think it's the same as this label it says 4R7 so I reckon that's probably 4.7 ohms we've got this interesting thing when they're labeling electronic components that they'll use the R to indicate that it's resistance and they'll also put the R in the place where the decimal point would be and let's see um, over here we've got this honking big thing, and I believe that will be an electrolytic capacitor. So it's a capacitor, same as these little guys, um, but it is uh, using a different sort of chemistry going on. And the chemistry with these ones is interesting. If you get them backwards, they can explode. Uh, this, I believe, will be a, a timing crystal. And if I pull it away, that says 24.99. 3B25. It's interesting. Might be able to look that up and figure out exactly what that means, but I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, we've also got this big integrated circuit. And it's got lots of little connectors connecting it out to the rest of the circuit board. And you can see it connecting sometimes to capacitors, sometimes going off to these little circles. And these circles, it's going through the board. And the connection comes up on the other side. It looks kind of like a street map, but each of these lines is actually a bit of copper underneath. You can see it, and these are effectively tiny little wires. This writing on here, now that we have the internet, uh, it's amazing. If you search for these uh, codes, you'll often be able to find out just what this is for. I can have a look at that later, but right now I'm going to keep moving. Uh, this one also has some labels. We can look that up and figure out what that chip is for. 
So the integrated circuits, man, they're pretty cool. You see how this board has all these tracks and components on it? This thing has even more, but much tinier and for a specific purpose. It also have a lot of transistors. Uh, we got this, oh, let's turn it up this way. Turn it around. Got an interesting little squiggle there. That's an odd one. Be interesting to try and figure out what that squiggle is for. If you know what it's for, feel free to make a comment. I reckon it'd be possible to find out. Um, maybe here's the top of the electrolytic capacitor again. And we have this thing. Now, if you want to, you can go ahead and search for that code. See if you can figure out what it is. I bet it's part of the power supply. And that's my guess. Probably a voltage regulator, maybe. Probably, maybe. Not sure. Okay, so we have this circuit board, which has the connector to the outside world. A bunch of other things. And these three connectors used to connect to here. Set that aside for now. And see what we can do about getting some more bits out. And this is where we run into, I think, problem where we want to get that faceplate off. Now, can't get the faceplate off unless we eject this. Oh, hang on. Let me see. Oops. Where's my pry? Here we go. This one's going to help. So we can see it coming in and out back there. And I find that really interesting. We can see, let's see, push this. So when I push my um, paper clip in here, whole thing rises up. Let's try that again. So this, this part of the device, when this comes in, Watch it go down. So this whole thing clipped in. Do that one more time. When I push this in, it pushes this up, which allows the drive to eject. So this is where our CD would normally go. Oh, the whole thing's trying to fall out the bottom. Let's get this top off. There's two uh, edges there, I push those in, probably easier to push them in a screwdriver. And this is where using a screwdriver can be dangerous. You see, if I push really hard here, push down, and then I slip, I might stab myself in the hand. Um, and if I push down really hard on here, and then maybe a bit of the plastic flies off and bounces around, it might get me in the eyes. So I need to be careful. So I'm going to hold down fairly low. So I'm pushing with the hard part of the screwdriver, but I've got quite a bit of control still. Let's come loose. And that one. There we go. That's also loose. You can see when it released, it released with a fair bit of force because I was pulling on things. And that can be dangerous. So we just need to be careful about that sort of thing. So that's come loose. There's an interesting little bit here. Now this would be a, a bit of a thrust bearing. Keep the top part spinning. Put that aside. Now we can see through the top of the device. Now if I put this back in roughly where it was. See, we've got the sled. This moves up and down. Our CD or DVD sits in this part and we push it in and it brings the CD so that the center of the CD sits just above this. And this is the part that spins the CD when it's there. Let's see, can I remove the black bit? Oh, here's another interesting bit. You can see just here, when I'm driving this in and out, you can see bits moving. Let me grab a pen. So if I mark that, that will help. We 
can see that spin around. So this is happening when I push this in and out, this spins around. Normally, this spins around to push, there you go, the CD in and out. Because normally we'd be using this button. But that's not going to work right now because we're not powered on. But so moving this in and out is driving this. So this motor here is what pushes the CD or the DVD in and out. This motor here is what spins the CD itself. And we've got another motor sitting here. And if I push this part forwards and back, it might be hard to tell. Let me see. That one. Fold. There we go. Can you see that this looks a lot like it's moving up and down, but there's nothing coming out here. It's not actually moving up and down, it's spinning. So when this motor spins, it pushes this part this way and this way. So we've got something that moves things in a straight line. This bar here has grooves in it, and those grooves mean that when this spins, this goes forwards and backwards. Let's get a bit of video of that bar. So I've put a green mark on the bar so that you can see that it's actually spinning. It's not moving up and down. Because each of the grooves kind of looks like it's staying, like it's moving up and down. But it's actually a spinning bar spun by the motor at the top here. At the top. There's the motor uh, out of focus. Um, but that spins this bar. And as that bar spins, it pushes this thing up and down. All right.